Physical abilities such as strength, speed, agility, endurance, and coordination are fundamental in sports. But mental abilities such as focus, concentration, motivation, confidence, resilience, and decision making can heavily influence an athlete's performance, especially when it matters the most. If you want the mental edge in sport and life, check out the Max Out Mindset for Volleyball Book and Workbook or the Max Out Mindset for Softball Book and Workbook. A guide for coaches, athletes, teams, and parents to help you be in the best position to max out when it matters the most. Welcome to the Max Out Mindset Podcast with your host, Coach Jess. Jess serves as an elite mindset coach to Division I, high school and club athletes, teaching them elite mindset skills, such as confidence and composure, to put them in the best position to max out when it matters the most. Hey listeners, thanks for joining. I have a, a coaching friend and colleague here with us today, Kristen Kelsey. She's the associate head coach at the University of Minnesota. And prior to that position, she spent just some really great time there at VCN in Lincoln, Nebraska, as the uh, associate director for the club. But also she coached two teams as well, 16s and 18s division. Another cool aspect about Kristen is that she was a student athlete there at Michigan State as well. I'm going to let her share her volleyball journey, and we're going to welcome her to the show today. Kristen, how are you? Jazz, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about your volleyball journey. Obviously, you've spent years as a coach, but it started as a student athlete. Can you kind of share your journey? Yeah, um, I was reflecting on that this morning before we met and just kind of yield to myself. Um, I was listening some, to some former podcasts that you and Doc have done, and my journey started the summer before fifth grade. Um, I started playing volleyball. I went to a camp. My parents are both in the high school system, and I went to their high school volleyball camp. And um, if you were to see pictures of me in fifth and sixth grade, which maybe you have, no way in your in your thought would you be like, oh, this is a Big Ten athlete, right? Like I just like wasn't an athlete. I was a really big little kid. I, um, you know, did soccer and everything growing up. But my journey was just kind of, it's kind of um, an interesting story that I was never on an elite team. I was on the third team, the fourth team. I wasn't super athletic. I think I touched like nine, seven at my peak of all of my, um, you know, athleticism, but I learned how to set. And so that mm -hmm. summer before fifth grade, I, um, took a ball and I was on the wall for the rest of the summer and started fifth grade and started playing club. Um, and I just learned how to set a volleyball and then how to be a leader and a great teammate and that hard work. And I think that little chip on my shoulder of I'm not a great athlete and I never was on a one team until my 18th year. Like that is a big part of, of my story and, and my confidence comes through my hard work. And so um, that's when I started. I was super fortunate to um, play for Kathy George at Michigan State and had a really incredible career. Um, volleyball wise, we were super successful, sweet 16s, academic all American. But also, I always say, like, I feel like I just squeezed everything out of that experience that I could. I was SAC president. I wanted a mission trip. Like, Michigan State was very good to me. Um, and then she offered me the assistant, like, full time assistant coaching job three months after I graduated. I was 22. And looking back, it was it was wild that she trusted me and she saw um, this young coach in me and really gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to now be sitting here at Minnesota in the role that I currently hold. Tell me a little bit more about why you coach. You know, I think being a, a student athlete first, you have so many rich experiences. You were a three-time captain. You had a lot of accolades. You're a great scholar in the classroom, but what was that jump? Like, why? What's your why as a coach? And you're still coaching today. So that's a huge testament. Yeah, I really fell in love with coaching. So a little bit about like my family. My whole family is in education. My sister's a coach. My dad is a coach and a clinical psychologist. He actually played football at the U for two years, which is like such a like full circle moment. Um, my mom coached our whole life growing up. And so I think it was like in my blood, but it was never something I was like, oh, I want to coach one day. Like I was kind of a nerd. I want to go to grad school. You know, I I didn't know like exactly what I wanted to do. Um, my degree was in psychology. And then it was the summer. It was summer camps at Michigan State. And I just like signed up for all of them. I love them to the point where the summer before my senior year, our assistant, Mike Golick, said, hey, 
you're going to run our setting camp. And I'm like 21 years old. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, like you're, you're really good at this and you are passionate about it. And the kids love you. And like, let's like, we're going to be there with you, but like, can you, let's plan it together and just open my eyes to like coaching. And, and, And I know summer camp isn't like coaching, you know, college volleyball, but it was really that first experience of someone saying like, Hey, like you're good at this. And like, I believe in you. Let's do this together. Um, And so I think for me, like I love coaching because I'm a very relationally driven person. And so I love that volleyball is a awesome female sport. It's I get I have so privileged to coach at the highest level. I love the game. I love coaching the positions I coach in the team. But I also love the relationships and the impact that I'm able to have um, on these student athletes, on these young women, similarly to the impact that coaches have had on me. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a recipe, right? It's probably like a lot of winning and competitiveness, right? I don't think any of us coach cause we hate to, you know, I love winning, hate losing. Um, I love, you know, the, the work ethic part of it of like you get to the end of the year and you put so much into it, but then there's this other side that I love the relationships, the um, opportunity that we have to lead these young women into like strong, independent women when they graduate here. Like, I want you to be an All American, but I want you to walk out of Minnesota also holding your head high of like, I'm ready to conquer the world. And that, to me, those two are just as important to each other than than any other lesson you'll learn in life. That's so key and so important that you share that. You know, I think Doc and I and our team here at Max Out Mindset, we believe in coaching life and sport. And you just mentioned relationships are part of the why you still coach today. And so I know that we we have uh, had so many conversations about the importance of mindset, right? You can train it just like any other physical skill. But what are your thoughts when you think of maxing out and you you talk about the frame of mindset and then maybe share with our listeners how our path crossed? Yeah. um, When I think about maxing out, I think of using every tool that you have every opportunity that you have every ounce of um, work ethic and talent that you have to make the most out of any experience you're given. And that can be at any level, whether it's high school, collegiate, professional, you could even go outside of the sports world into your nine to five job, or it's that you're maxing out the opportunities and the talent that you have. And that looks different for everyone, right? Like my God-given athleticism was a lot different than my best friend in high school is Kelsey Robinson, who's an Olympian, right? And just our athleticism was different. But I would say we both maxed out our volleyball journeys to the different opportunities that we were given. And so I think that is going to look different for every athlete. Um, But I love the way Doc says this. And he says, like, to look back and have no regrets. And I think that's... um, You're always going to have, like my dad always says, you're always going to have what ifs in life. Like, what if I did that? What if I did this? But you're the only one who can live with the decisions that you make. And to be able to look back and confidently say like, hey, I did everything that I could and I either fell short of my goal or I achieved my goal. But knowing like I I maxed out, I squeezed out, I did everything in my control, I think is is how I how I picture like maxing out. See, and we we dive into so many great conversations you and I about what does that look like you know Mm -hmm. maxing out giving it your all you know I think mine it comes from the power of choice right Mm -hmm. every decision you make has a positive or negative consequence and to own that decision right in life life is messy right a lot of highs a lot of lows and I think that's one of those things I appreciate about you you know as a as a coach former athlete but also a really great friend and a great person I do need to highlight a little bit about your Instagram video that went viral (laughs) about you mic'd up and I just think you know I think I want to hear from your perspective right like you were just you you were authentic you were coaching in the moment and I I think the world got a little bit of a glimpse of of how you coach and why you coach and Doc and I are so excited because we get to see these coaches in action all day long you know and unless you're a direct athlete or on staff with them not everybody gets to see that authenticity and how you do it yeah. any your thoughts on on that video going viral and uh, what is your reaction to it it was so funny. I um like we had these like long clips of like me and Eric and Kean and EJ, our sports information director, was like, hey, there's this awesome clip of you and Elise. Like, we're gonna just do like a short little teaser. 
he's like, can I, um, I, I'm a millennial. I don't even know what it's called. Like, um, like I'm tagged in it. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, that's great. Like my followers will see it too. And, um, a collaborator, I was a collaborator and it has totally taken off. And I think it's, I, I've tried to think about like what resonates with people. Um, but for me, like my coaching style is like a dialogue. Right. And so I have talked a lot, like I work with our setters here in Minnesota and I've talked a lot with Mel and Elise and Chloe of like, I don't know your history coming up to this point. So I know where we want to go and I know how to get there. But I also need to know what do you know? What do you not know? What do you understand? What's confusing for you? Like, what do you feel confident in? And so especially this spring coming into a new program, um, there's a lot of dialogue. It's not just my way or the highway. This is how we're doing it. It's like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Like, this is the way Keegan and, and our staff believes we want to train it. But I want you to have um, autonomy in that. And I want you to know that, like, I care about how we get there. Not just that we get there, but I care about how we get there. And so for Elise, we had talked a lot about her taking risks, right? And not just playing it safe. And that's where Spicy came from. I was calling her in practice. She would, like, make a long string set or, you know, a gap off the net. And I'd be like, all right, spicy enchilada. Like, you know, we, <laughs> you're my spicy enchilada. And then she kind of like started wearing that. Like, yeah, I'm spicy. And the girl started doing it. And so when she came on the bench and she was second guessing herself, right? Like I should have just trusted my hitters. It's like, yeah, you're spicy. Like you do this all day in practice, you know, like, and so I think, I, I think it resonated with people because it wasn't just a coach saying you did this wrong. You did this wrong. You need to do this. And you don't get a say, you don't get not, you don't get it. Um, any voice in it. And and, there, and to be honest, there's times that that happens. There's times that there's not time for an athlete or the impact or the, the tact can't be there because you're in the heat of the moment. But in a moment like that, where it's just, Hey, I know you're frustrated. Come talk to me. Like that's, that's my coaching style. And that's, um, I think that's what resonated with people is there are a lot of coaches who maybe, I don't know, don't do it that way. I, I don't know, but it, it, I had to turn my notifications off. It was, it was, it's been crazy. So at Max Out Mindset, Doc and I teach a lot about the four C's of elite mindset, commitment, confidence, concentration, and composure. So Kristen, tell me a little bit more about how you start to build confidence in your athletes on and off the court. And then also how you build that as a coach. Yeah, man, t confidence, I think is a really tough piece. Um, Partly because I think you talked about this, trust is a big part of that in the coach um, player dynamic. Secondly, I think it's hard because I think every athlete gains their confidence a little bit differently, right? Like confidence is built through success and overcoming obstacles and hard work. But I think some athletes um, have confidence because of their past experiences in different ways. My confidence as an athlete, as a coach, doesn't come from being, you know, the tallest, the strongest, the fastest. It comes from like, I'm going to outwork you. And that's what I did my entire career was the kid on the threes team, the kid who couldn't jump very high, you know, like I'm just going to outwork you and it, it paid off. And so I, I find that in my college career is like, is, and I know you can't just like outwork everyone, but coupled with the knowledge and the opportunities and doing it with integrity, I think is how my confidence has been built. But there are some athletes that confidence is just built differently. So that's where I think where the trust factor comes in. And it's kind of cliche, but I love the saying, um, you know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that has been a big part of our Minnesota values. It's not that phrase in general, but just having that care and concern for these athletes that we're still forming brand new relationships as we're trying to challenge them as elite athletes. Um, and how do we have those follow-up conversations, those conversations, learning more about them, not only, okay, why do you hit four to four this way? But like, w talk to me a little bit about your journey. Um, because I think that's how you find how each athlete fills their cup and builds their confidence. And so for some athletes that might just be being in the gym for hundreds of hours by themselves, working on their serve, some athletes need a little bit more, um, of positive affirmation, right? That's their love it language. Some athletes have more confidence just from they've always been that kid, you know? And so I think finding your athletes why um, is really important. And then knowing 
I'm you're, you don't just gain confidence by me telling you you're a stud, right? I can say, hey, you know, Taylor, you're a stud. Well, Taylor knows that she hit negative today. So now there's a cognitive dissonance there that that trust is it it it, it um it takes away from the trust that you have because you're not being truthful. So I think a lot of people think confidence is like me pumping your tires, but um that's really not where conf- confidence is built in the tough moments and overcoming obstacles. Um, and we try to do that in our gym every day, whether that's through different drills or different conversations that we have. How has mindset played a like mindset training played a role for you as a coach and also at the program there at Minnesota? How do you train that? And is it just once in a while? Is it every day? Is it just part of, you know, they train reps in the gym by passing, right? What does mindset look like? What re- what reps are are in play? Um, that was something that I really when Keegan and I first started talking about this opportunity is um, he shared with me his program values. And from the get-go, they just really aligned with how I believe coaching should be. Um, and that's with having integrity at the front forefront. That's with having caring concern for athletes. That's challenging them as competitors, but also to be the best people that they can be. And so we really started our time here at Minnesota with a lot of team meetings and a lot of let's break down what it means to have an elite culture, what it means, what's what are the what are the um, values of Minnesota gonna volleyball going to be? How are we going to handle conflict, whether that's within each other, within our staff? Um, how do we stay loyal to each other even in moments where we the other is not present? And so I think. For us, like we really dialed in hard um, early of like, hey, we can teach you to serve and pass. But if we don't have a culture and a foundation built, that that will ultimately break down. And then what do we have to stand on? And so we talk about it as a stat, as a as a program um, once or twice a week, honestly. And then we have our individual check in meetings where we have that, those conversations as well with our staff. And now that's outside of the sports psychology resources that our student athletes have. Um, but Keegan really wanted this program to be built on that foundation. And um, that totally resonated with me in, in our in the interview process of like, okay, I'm I'm all in with that. That's that's awesome. We teach core values and to live out those core values, there's authenticity and accountability in that. And I really like hearing that because that's a foundation that you can hold your team and your staff to. Mm -hmm. My next big question is this. You talk about core values for you as a coach. Is that (laughs) similar to Minnesota? Do you have any to add? What's core to to Kristen Kelsey? Tell me, what what do you live out? What are your core values? What keeps you you forward and, and humble? Oh, that's a really good question. And I feel like I've done a lot of those exercises over the years that you like pick out your core values. And I do think that different life experiences and different um, times of your life, those change. I would say that um, the three that come to mind, just like at, if you were to tear away every layer of, of my identity, which is which is a big, big part is volleyball coach, but I'm also a daughter and a sister and a friend. And um, I think if you tear that down and say like, what is Kristen? And who do I lay my head at night and say, I'm proud of it's um, that I'm kind, um, that I act with integrity and that I always go back to my faith. And I think those three have been like, consistent drivers for me in any part of my identity is like my faith has been my rock since childhood and honestly in the last year has um really kind of blossomed even more um my integrity is that i want to do things the right way it doesn't mean i'm perfect doesn't mean that i do all the time but i have a pretty strong gut when i when i used to tell my athletes like if it's not a yes, it's a no. Like if if it doesn't feel right and you have to question it, it's probably a no. And, um, you know, not trying to be too risk adverse, but just knowing like I want to do things the right way. And I think um, good things come to those who do it the right way. And then just being kind. Like I think that, again, I'm not perfect, but when I strive like in my daily life and my interactions is just 
to be to be kind and to be respectful and um to let those people I love know I love them, you know, and treat others the way I'd want to be treated. So wait, you're you're telling me you need others in your life? Mm-hmm. Yes. You're Very telling so. me you're telling me you have a community and that it's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah, and that's a hard lesson to learn, Jess. It is. Oh, let's talk about this. This is gonna be good. <laughs> and I, I say this, right? Because uh there's a stigma right around mental yeah. health and even just as athletes right you can talk about other categories as well but there's a stigma where i i can't be vulnerable because that's weakness or i i can't ask for help again another form of weakness dive into this a little bit for me just as a coach right and we'll talk about your athletes but as a coach you've had a lot of transition in the past year you know yeah. going from bcn there in lincoln going up north to minnesota what does vulnerability look like to you and what lesson have you learned Oh, baby, gloves, gloves are off. Here we go. Um, Vulnerability, I think, is extremely important in the trust dynamic. And I'm really fortunate. My father is a clinical psychologist who also was an elite, elite athlete and is a father of three girls and is a coach, you know, like, so I always, I'll be on the phone with him and I'll like, I can like visually in my head, see him like putting different hats on like dad hat, you know, trying to be supportive Mm -hmm. and then like psychologist hat, like letting me just like fully vent and then like coach hat of like, okay, like, you know, pull, pull him up by your bootstraps, kiddo, you know, like, (laughs) and so I think that, um, I was taught from a very early age, like your feelings and your emotions are valid and, you know, I, I struggled with anxiety quite a bit as an athlete and into my adult life at times. Um, and my dad used to always say like, okay, acknowledge the feelings that you're feeling, but don't become anxious because you're feeling that way. Cause that's only going to exasperate it. Right. So like, Hey, I'm feeling this way right now. Acknowledge it, validate it. Let's try to find the root of it instead of, Oh my gosh, why am I feeling like this? I can't believe I'm feeling this. And then all of a sudden, like the, for me, the water's rising. Right. And so, um, I'm a huge proponent of asking for help. I'm a huge proponent of like, there are professionals that are trained to, to help walk us through different parts of our life. Um, I've always said that with my athletes, I've always been really honest about my journey with mental health, having my dad as a rock and just having no real stigma for me because I grew up with it in my family. Um, but then you go through a season of life where you now have to take your own advice. Right. And this past year of my life, prior to coming to Minnesota, there was a lot of change. I left a big 10 assistant coaching job in Lincoln or in, in Northwestern. I moved to Lincoln. I started, a, I never coached club volleyball in my entire life. I had a huge personal um, change, right? I was going to get married. Like it was just like this. I went from like this one job. I've had one job since I graduated college. It was assistant volleyball coach. And it was at Michigan State for eight years and three years at Northwestern, which was in Chicago, which was home to moving to a new part of the country, starting a new job, furthering a relationship to like a huge extent. Um, and it was scary, right? It was really scary. And I, having typically been the listener friend or the person that people come to now had to really have the courage to be vulnerable and and ask for help. Um, And I would be nowhere without one, my faith, but two, my community, whether that's my friends, whether that's my family, whether that's my mentors, you know, and Kathy George and Shane Davis, who helped me figure out what was next. Um, Whether that's Maggie Griffin at BCN. and, And I had one of the best years of my life coaching those kiddos and being a part of that organization. I didn't want to leave. I, I, I didn't want to leave UCF and I wasn't planning on leaving. Um, and I had this community of people that just wrapped their arms around me, but it was hard. It's hard to be vulnerable and it's hard to, um, to ask for help. But I had a couple of moments where I was like, Kristen, what would you tell an athlete or what would you tell your friends? Mm -hmm it's time, you know, it's time. And it, 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 it was a really good humbling moment for me of it takes courage and having to do that gives me better empathy for my athletes now or friends now or family now of, of the courage it takes to make the hard decisions versus the past. It was like, oh yeah, just make that decision or just 
you know, just do this. And it's like, no, now that I've been through the fire, I understand like, holy cow, that takes a lot of courage and time. And it's not always going to be on the time that you want it to be. So when we talk about vulnerability, right, and you had to be mindfulness in the moment to say, hey, like this is a little bit more than I can handle. You had to lean on your community, your mentors and to ask for help. Right. And the reason why I ask when did you know it's time to ask for help is because we have a lot of self-driven, very <laughs> self-led athletes and audience that we serve and they're they're good. It's yeah. good until it's not good. When did you realize, did you ask for help before you needed it or were you like, oh crap, I need help? Um, I think I think a little of both. In some areas, I felt like I had really strong community around me that I was able to ask for help right away. So my parents, Maggie, my pastor, I had people that I had a relationship with that I knew I could lean on without being maybe a burden, right? Or without. And then there got to a point where I was so overwhelmed that I knew I was past the point of like, I can no longer handle all of this change myself. Um, like I think for me, and I think it's different for every athlete, depending on, um, honestly their brain makeup and their experiences is for me, I get so like, there's so much to do. And I, that, that I get so overwhelmed that I just do nothing. And it was like a couple of days where I just felt like paralyzed, honestly, that I was like, okay, I probably need, um, to ask for more help. Right. And started mm-hmm. to, to talk to a therapist and started to go through that process because, I think you can see the warning signals and you're like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, like I'm, I'm don't come at me. I'm hedging them off. And then all of a sudden there's another experience that happens or new information. And you're like, okay, I, now I don't, I don't know where to go. And I, these people that I have been leaning on are, are amazing, but I need a, a different avenue. Um, and I think sometimes that's with our athletes too. In college, they have their friends and their teammates. They have their coaches, they have their parents, which are all really great, valuable resources. Um, But at the end of the day, there's nothing like talking to someone who's one, professionally trained, clinically trained, but also unbiased. They don't have any stake. They're not at practices. They don't control your playing time. They don't love you so unconditionally as your parent that it's hard for them to remove that. And so I think that was, that's kind of sometimes the way that I talk about is just to have an unbiased ear who has no skin in the game other than helping me process um and that looks different for everyone in terms of of the time element of when that happens i kind of drove that question in deeper because i think your level of vulnerability to share those details is really helpful and timing is different for everyone and i liked how you highlighted that but you mentioned resources and so thanks for diving in a little bit deeper. It's not always fun to talk about vulnerability or, you know, I had a really terrible moment and there's a moment where I just sat still, you know, how many of us are looking to fill that void to go, 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 but stillness brings us into the present. And so a lot of respect for you, a lot of respect for you thanks. and mentorship. I love this word, but I think the world doesn't know much about it. How would you describe mentorship and how have you been a mentor and how has mentorship impacted you? And then we can move on. But I, I really wanted to highlight this moment because it's a it's a new concept for most. Yeah. Um, I am so lucky, like looking back on the mentors that, you know, honestly, I feel have God has placed into my life. Um, some of them being really strong female coaches that I had that showed me that you can do it. Like you can be a strong female coach and lead women and have a family and it's possible. Um, I've had really strong male mentors, right, who have shown me the other side of the coin and have led in different ways, but also authentic to them. Um, I still don't feel old enough to be a mentor, but I am. I had a, a former player who called me yesterday, actually, and had a life question and just, hey, I don't know who to ask this to can you be my person? And I think in those moments, you see the relationship that you cultivated for four or five years, maybe six, seven years with the recruiting process, say, okay, she's not calling me to ask whether she should run the gap go or the gap jet, right? Like that was a small part of our of our relationship. It was an extremely important part. But now she's calling because she wants to start a family and she has 
some questions, you know? And so I think that's where um, my why of, of relationships and impact driven coaching is, is so um, it shows up in those moments years later, right? When that relationship is still there. Um, and it shows up in my mentorship, right? Like Kathy George has been a huge mentor for me in my life. She gave me this opportunity. She was also the one that was my phone call during a lot of the time period of change and has been my biggest, um, you can do this. You can do this. Like you're ready. You are beyond ready. You don't think you're ready. You are so much more ready than you are, right? Like she'll call me out when I'm self-doubting. She'll call me out when I'm being to like, I don't know, you know, and um, is a huge reason that I'm here at Minnesota. And so I think that I hope one day to be the mentors to the young women that I'm coaching that she has been to me. That's awesome. I, yeah. I can't, uh, I can't express it enough because what if she, what if she wasn't in your life? What if you didn't have that encouragement? You know, where would you be? I think it's cool to look back on. Yeah. It's awesome. And even now, like being here at Minnesota, she's, um, you know, she's just been incredibly excited and wants to come out and watch practice. And like she's a lifelong learner and she's still like that person that um, now now it's cool, too, because she'll call me and she'll ask me questions and ask me for advice. I'm like, OK, this is like so full circle. You know, it's really it's really cool. And I think having strong mentors um regardless of gender or role or any of the above, like is so important in your profession to have like a, a very trusting relationship of someone you can be honest with. Maybe it can be phrased as iron sharpens iron. Absolutely. Two way street. Yeah. I think you and I were talking the other day and there happened to be a friend or, or a colleague share a note with you. Maybe mm -hmm. the best advice or something to help you in the present moment. Do you want to kind of share on that? I think it's a really good message. Yeah, I was going through. Um, it was a little while ago, and it you know I think I think one thing athletes um, learn a lot about I think post graduation is their identity, right? And how do you how do you have your identity in your sport, which is you know, 80, 90% of your collegiate life, but also have your identity in other parts of your life because at some point your sport will end. And hopefully you get to go play for Team USA or overseas and that identity still fulfills you for a long time. But you and I both know at some point my identity as an athlete had to end and coaching began, but it took me a while to find my identity in coaching, just like it takes you a while to find your identity as an athlete. And so um, I was going through that identity like, man, am I making an impact, right? Like, I just want to make an impact on the people in my life. I want to make an impact on the athletes. And she wrote me this note and it was such a good reminder. And it said, you are an amazing, kind, you know, all these really um, powerful adjectives, human who also coaches volleyball. And I was like, you're right. Like my identity is in is in is in my faith, right? It's in Jesus. My identity is in my core values. My identity is Kristen. And I get to use that to be an elite volleyball coach and impact young women. But my coach, my identity is not in did we win the last election year? And and that's a part of my identity. But if that's the only way that I find joy and success, then I will have failed, right? Um, and so I, I keep that right where I can see it. And it's a good reminder of, yeah, I want, I want to win a big 10 championship and a national championship. And I want our women to do everything that they set their eyes on because of who I am. Um, not that's the only thing that I am. I have to pause because do you value more in outcome? Or do you value more in the process? I mean, the answer to that is the process, right? Like that is the answer to the question is like value the process, process driven. But it is so difficult, I think, to say that 
and actually mean it because yeah, like we want to win a Big Ten championship. Like, yeah, we want to be in Tampa. Like the outcome is a direct reflection of the process, right? So as much as the process is like 90% of the equation, the outcome is is what other people see. It's the perception. It's your reputation. It's, you know, your next job is all based on that outcome, really. Um, but you don't get that outcome without living in the process. And so I think that's... Um, that's the reminder. It's like it has to be process driven. You have to find the joy in the process in the hard days and the in the good days in order to reap that 10% outcome. You answered a really hard question. Great job. I, I kind of I don't know if I answered it. I kind of picked both, but <laughs> well, and here's the thing though. Like I think we're you're an elite coach, right? I'm an elite competitor, elite mindset coach. Of course I want results and outcome. Yeah. But how do you teach your athletes that are so outcome driven, right? stats you know you want to put the best players on the on the court right you talk about results results outcome outcome yeah how do you be in the nitty-gritty process and enjoy the day-to-day enjoy the grind enjoy the preparation that in return you just said you know your outcome will be because at times your outcome won't always be what you set out for it to be like you aren't always going to get the goal you wanted yeah so tell me how you fall in love with the process and how you teach that as a coach because i think that's that's why you're at minnesota you're the best of the best. You're a great teacher and coach. How do you do it? I wish I just had like a formula, like do this, 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 and this. You don't have a formula. Um, what are you talking no, about? No, I don't. And, you know, I think um, I've learned a lot in these six months from Keegan and his ability to stay present in the process has been um obviously like fun to learn from, but also to work alongside and like, to remind each other and to challenge each other and to know when to push this new group and to know when to say, okay, we're not where we want to be. We need to push and to know when, hey, this is a lot of change or this is different and when to pull back. And I think if we were only concerned about the outcome or only concerned about numbers or stats, we wouldn't be able to live in that moment and open our eyes to what's actually happening in front of us Like, okay, we need to pull back or, okay, we need to push or, okay, we need to have some follow-up conversations because maybe there was some conflict in practice, right? Like, we're not just going to let the rest of our day go. And he models that so incredibly well that he will have an interaction in practice. And after practice, he's sitting down with that athlete and they're talking through it. And it's like, wow, like what a powerful coach to say, hey, I'm going to push you. You might not always like it, right? But I'm going to hold you to our core values. But then we're going to talk about it. We're going to make sure that that trust is is fluid between us and that you know the care and concern that I have for you as a human, as, as a young woman, as an athlete. Um, and so I think he has really showed me that you can do it. You can train at the highest level for the highest goals, but also stay process focused. And sometimes it looks slower than you want it to look. And And reminding each other, you know, at the conference table, like, hey, we know that this feels slow, but we're doing it right. And we've committed to doing it right at Minnesota. That's why we're here. Because minute, minute, we want Minnesota to win a national championship and we want to do it the right way. And then his daily interactions that just are authentic to that commitment um, have really shown me that like you can do this at the highest level. I'm excited. I'm excited for your journey. I'm excited for all of the learnings. I mean, you just said in a short six months, you've learned, you've you've learned that in the past, but you've gained a deeper understanding of that. And it's just, I don't know, getting outside your comfort zone and putting yourself around elite mindsets, elite coaches, elite athletes. It's really cool to hear, you know, what you're learning. Okay, Kristen, I want to share with the audience just a really great conversation we had in December in Omaha during the AVCA convention uh, this past winter. And uh, you and I got to really talking about dreams, talking about life calling. Uh, I had shared with you a little bit more about my passion to be an elite mindset coach, mentor to athletes. And uh, what is it like for you, right? And, and how would you mentor and coach? But you have a goals board or a dream board, or you have opportunities that are completely outside your comfort zone. And you have this question, do I stay in my comfort? Or do I go after my dreams of being comfortable? 
And so I just kind of wanted to hear from you, an extension from our conversation in December. How do you go after your dreams? How do you know when it's right to make that decision and get uncomfortable? I vividly remember this conversation, and I don't even know if I told you this because I didn't tell many people. Um, that conversation that night was the same day that Keegan called um, and said, hey, you know, I have this opportunity. I am calling you. And where are you at? Like, I know you're in the club space, you know, and um, I remember feeling like talking to you. I'm like, OK, this is this is this is Jesus talking to me like this is divine intervention, right? Like I, I you know, for the the listeners, Jess and I had met a handful of times, right? Like maybe two, two or three times. And now now we know each other better. Like we don't small talk. We just like, how's your heart? We get right into it. But, you know, here's this woman who I don't know that well, who's like asking me about my hopes and dreams. And this once in a lifetime phone call had happened that morning and it just felt so like kind of surreal. Um, but I, I was in that exact space. I was in that space of, OK, I love my present job. I love the people and the community that I have. You know, I think um, I think when my personal life had changed over the summer that fall, last fall, I really did a lot of deep diving into like, what do I want? Like, do I want to stay in club? Do I want to go back to college? If there's a one thread in my life, I think it has been to trust your gut, your instinct. I, I, there's times in my life when there's no other explanation than the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's been some decisions I've had to make in the last year that I can't tell you why. And people thought I was crazy. And it it was for me, the Holy Spirit just saying, stop right where you are, you know, like, don't pass go, don't collect $200. And I felt like I had had a number of, of phone calls about college jobs. And I said, I just, it doesn't feel right. I don't want to rush back into this if I'm not all in. And I'm very happy where I'm at. Okay. So a couple more weeks go by, we're going to convention and I get a phone call that I don't recognize. Well, I don't coach club volleyball or I don't coach college volleyball. So I don't answer it because I don't have to answer mm -hmm. my phone all the time anymore. And then I get a text. It was a number I didn't have. And it was Keegan. And we talked that day. And I had this instant moment of, okay, here we go. Like, this is the call. Like, this is the one. And I'm very much like a 24 hour sleep on it person. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to make a decision. I just told him, hey, yes, I'm interested because of, because of the pedigree of Minnesota and Minnesota's always been a school to me that has done it the right way. They've done it with integrity, with Fochieber and Hugh and um, the support, you know, and just who Minnesota is as a volleyball school, coupled with what I have heard about Keegan and just his integrity and his character. I said, okay, this, yeah, I'm interested. Like, let, let's let both sleep on it, but I'm interested. Um, and then that night, you asked me a lot of probing questions and we talked a lot about when do you leave your comfort zone and when do you pursue something that's scary and maybe give up an op a, a very happy lifestyle or coaching a certain school or club in order to pursue pr pursue something further um and i feel like i lived in that conversation that you and i had for about 2 weeks through the process and um, for me, it just, you know, you make pros and cons lists, you talk to other people. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I've gotten where I am today, personally and professionally, because I've trusted my work ethic. I've trusted my heart. I've trusted my my intuition. But I've also trusted like my why and my intent. And um, again, I have not been perfect. I have made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um but I knew this opportunity at Minnesota to work with Keegan and to coach this group of athletes to really, you know, it was daunting, move to a new city where I knew nobody, to a new place to start over. It was scary. Um, and I kept going back to our conversation of, okay, but sometimes scary is 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 the is the is the right decision to make. And you have to leave your comfort zone and you can be appreciative of. I'm so appreciative of my year in Lincoln at BCN and all of the lifelong friends that I always say, like, our relationship wasn't very long, but the depth of our relationship mm. is as deep as my friends from grade school to an extent. Um, but I trusted that 
that feeling in my, you know, for me, the Holy Spirit, but the feeling in my gut that said, this is, this is scary, but this is right. And I feel that way. I feel that way at Minnesota. There's times I go, I don't know why I'm here yet. I don't know everything. I, you know, I'm still learning, but like, I'm supposed to be here. Um, and I feel incredibly grateful and blessed that I listened to that, that I had friends and mentors like you who probed me to listen to that. Um, and then I get to wear maroon and gold every day. So go, go first. Go, go. So here we go. <laughs> I, I, I just study a lot of our elite athletes and coaches and you just hit something really special is that they do the work to be mindful enough to know, right? To know themselves, to know what will push them. And the elite think they don't necessarily always compare to others, but they compare to, are they better than they were yesterday, right? Yeah. Do you leave it better than when we found it? And it's been really fun to be a part of your journey. And I, I thank you for that and to see you go be courageous and brave and, and also be vulnerable in those moments of like, I need help. Or I just need a, a friend to explore this new city. I think there's so much just value in you just taking it one day at a time. And and I know our, our listeners are learning from you. I'm learning from you. And uh, suddenly a Gopher fan. So, you know, there's two wins. I, I want to go back. You look at your 16-year-old self, right? You said that volleyball club was a thing, but not a thing. What advice would you give to your 16-year-old self? Um, we do have a lot of listeners in that teenage age group. What's the best advice? What would you say? Man, I, I, you said 16 and I went right back. Um, I went immediately back, flashball memory, to sitting in the car with my mom before club tryouts. Not sure. I had played at, at Sports Women's at this point like six years and I was not sure I was going to make the program. Like, mm. And if I could go back and just like sit in that back seat and watch that conversation again, I would tell myself, um, don't give up. And I would tell myself, like, it will all be worth it. And I like look at myself at 16, who had no idea the um, opportunities that would be afforded for her or the friendships and the community she would gain or the trials that she would go through. Um, and in that moment, like not making the club or the elite team or and, you know, not getting the phone calls you want on June 15th or not getting the scholarship that you want or getting a partial or, you know, like not making the top team is so big at 16. It's it's your life. It's so big. It's so important. And and that's true. But don't give up because the lessons you learn in those moments and the the toughness and the grit and the hard work that those moments you can go one way or the other. You can give in and say, I'm done. I can't do this. Or you can say, no, like I'm going to bet on myself and I'm going to, I'm going to do everything in me to max out. Right. Um, and I would remind her that it will be worth it. And one day you will be the associate head coach of Minnesota and look back and say, man, what a journey. Um, and just have this gratitude in your heart for, for all of it. Um, but 16 is hard and it's, it's tough. And yet if you can put your head down every day and stay true to yourself and, and work your butt off, I think really good things happen. And so, yeah, I would just tell her to don't give up, stay the course, stay in the fight. It'll all be worth it. Growth through adversity. Mm -hmm. And I think people see the results, but they don't understand all of the trials, right? All of those moments where you wanted to give up. And I think we both do this. We coach our athletes and coach coaching our peers too, is there's a moment where there needs to become a, a breakthrough, right? A breakthrough moment. But in order to break through, that means you have to break through something and that is painful. But we just think if we're just like breezing, walking through this, like this is going to be so easy. But a breakthrough is something where you actually have to endure a trial. And there's a moment where do I just throw in the towel or do I keep moving on? And when you talked about going back to your 16 year old self, I was picturing myself in that vehicle. And in that moment of man, my heart, right. And the fact that you didn't give up and mm -hmm. you have things in your future where there's moments where you want to give up, but you've learned a really key lesson, grow mm -hmm. through adversity and look what it's taught you. Yeah. Yeah. And I ended up making the program and then two years later set the 18 elite team to a champ, uh, 18 open championship. Like it was just, it was like, but I, I, my mom and I still talk about that moment in the car of, 
um, okay, we can turn this car around or we can push through. And um, yeah, I just, like you said, it's you're you never know how close you are to that next breakthrough and just lean on your community, be vulnerable, work hard and stay true to your core values and who you are. And I think those things will it, every everyone's journey and chapter and maxing out looks different. Um, but it, those things will always, always pay off. And Keegan says a lot, the game gives back, right? Like the game gives back. And I've been incredibly fortunate to have the game give back in a lot of different ways, personally and professionally. And um, yeah, it's been it's been quite a journey and I'm excited for this next chapter. Kristen, thanks for your time. Uh, I, I do think the value that you brought and the insight that you shared, I know that we could talk forever, you know, just on on your heart, how you coach, why you coach. And I'm excited to see you continue to serve there at Minnesota and uh, thankful for Keegan, right, to give us the opportunity to have you on today. And uh, really excited because I'm looking forward to some spicy uh, setting routines there on the court. And I'm, I'm looking forward to more mic'd up opportunities with you. But we can laugh at the end of the day. I appreciate you and appreciate the fact that you are are giving back to the sport. And we thank you. Thanks, Jess. I appreciate you and this opportunity. And I'm um, really, really grateful for our chat today. So thanks for having me. Physical abilities such as strength, speed, agility, endurance, and coordination are fundamental in sports. But mental abilities such as focus, concentration, motivation, confidence, resilience, and decision making can heavily influence an athlete's performance, especially when it matters the most. If you want the mental edge in sport and life, check out the Max Out Mindset for Volleyball book and workbook or the Max Out Mindset for Softball book and workbook. A guide for coaches, athletes, teams, and parents to help you be in the best position to max out when it matters the most.